All right, let's talk about Ethan Horvath. We talked about him potentially starting this upcoming game, but some interesting news, not in him for us, his club over in England just got promoted to the Premier League and the goalkeeper who starts over him, Samba, wants out. Gets promoted, wants out. Is this good news for Horvath and the U.S. men's national team because he could be a number one? It doesn't seem like that's a theme that we currently enjoy because if you're a U.S. men's national team goalkeeper, you're a number two over in the Premier League. And it looks like that might happen again. Nick Pope is apparently being linked with the move to Forrest. But if he becomes a Premier League starter, should Greg consider him being the first choice spot? We answered that a little bit before. Heath, I'll come to you first. Pretty good news for Horvath, but obviously, obviously he's got to make the most of this opportunity. Yeah, have we ever started, uh, uh, at least in like a, a World Cup, a non-starting goalkeeper? I think we've always had a starter, right, at, at the yes. highest level. When you think about the the Keller, Friedel, Howard era, they kind of all followed through. Even the Brad Gazan era, by that time, he was he was starting regularly for, for Villa. I, I, that if he's starting, then for sure, like he's got it's great for him if he's if he's going to get that start. But obviously, they're going to get an influx of cash. And they're gonna gonna they're gonna go with at least somebody to compete with him, if not the number one to lose that spot. Um, I don't think he's gonna automatically get that. But if he's if he's playing, then I think he has to become the number one. When I saw Sean Johnson, I know Sean Johnson. We've known him for a long time. He was in the national team from from literally from when I was still in the national team, and he's a fantastic player. Not as good as I, I think, in my opinion, as 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 Zach Steffen or Matt Turner. But if you look at his sharpness, if you look at his speed, if you look at his decision making, there is something to having that those minutes that I trust him more than I trust the other ones if they're not going to be playing come World Cup time. I, I think it truly does need to be somebody somebody that's playing regular games because you could just see a different level uh, to them than than, than otherwise. So if, if Ethan Horvath is starting and playing in the Premier League, then obviously he's got to be our number one because the other two, and you know, again, pending, pending a loan of some kind for, for Stefan or even Turner, if he goes in and, and immediately goes out, uh, you know, who knows? I think what's going to get scary, Charlie, and I'm going to mention something you said before, is if there are no easy answers. I mean, we talked about Chris Richards, who, if he starts playing for Bayern Munich regularly, yeah, he's got, going to be a lock. I mean, his club form alone will dictate that he should be starting for us and the club he's playing for, of course. But what if he, these he guys... He hasn't had great national team performances, by the way. That's um, true. But what if these guys... What, let's look at our goalkeepers, because we're talking about Horvath. But what if none of them are starting? I mean, who is the hot hand? Who do you go with? Knowing that there could be a Sean Johnson out there who's like standing on his head in MLS, do you risk that? You know, even though he performed well against Uruguay and made some unbelievable saves, it was my man of the match. Like that, that could be really tough. And I get the sense to Heath's point very early on, we probably aren't going to have a healthy 11, our first choice 11, because that's just how it goes. We're not going to be isolated. That's going to probably happen to every country. But what do you do if there's no easy answers there? That's going to be more of a gut feeling. And that gets a little scary for going into a World Cup, going with, I think that guy's going to play well today. You know, that that gets a little sketch. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> that's why the coaches get paid the, the big bucks to make those decisions. Huge bucks. And I think when you're looking at this group, we all know Stefan didn't play and was first choice over players who were playing. And that was through World Cup qualifying. And if you don't succeed there, you, there is no World Cup. So I think that gives you kind of the guideline that it's going to be between Stefan and Turner in the end. Those mm -hmm. two, because he prefers those two, and I think those are the two best keepers when it's all said and done. Now, if they're not playing and Horvath is playing in the Prem and getting shutouts and performing, then you, you have a real argument that Horvath should be the one. But I think as of now, Turner is your one. Stefan knows he needs to make a move to get consistent playing time and staying healthy. And then he goes right back to number one because he's better with his feet. And Greg Berhalter values that right now. Not to say that Matt Turner can't continue to improve with his feet, but I, I think we all know if Zach Stefan is playing heading into the World Cup, he will be the number one. Um so but either way, I'm not I'm not nervous. I, I there's nothing about me that's like, oh man, I'm I think we're in trouble because we our keepers aren't playing. Or I, I'm not nervous about that. They're very capable keepers, whether they are playing every week or they're just playing in reserve games and in and, and scrimmages. Uh, what I am concerned about is that center back spot and the nine. Those are the two positions I really am scared about. And we have to find some sort of, of player who can 
be the conduit between the nine and the midfield. Yeah, right, right. The, well, so I was going to say that that I think Musa can be the, that guy. The combination in midfield is still. I, I know we talked to me even a couple of months ago that MMA is the lineup or the midfield moving Th forward. That is, and now I get the sense that. But that was it, that was in the context of qualifying, though. By sure, the way, sure, where it's sure, a completely sure. you got to be a little bit more on the conservative side of of just pressure cover balance through that midfield and qualifying than what we've seen in these last two games that are international matches against a different type of opponent than playing down in, in, in Honduras, by the way. Sorry. No, no, no. That's, that's good. The context is important there. And I think that because we gave Brendan Aronson a chance and it looked pretty good against Morocco, we just want to see more of it and see if that actually helps us move forward and transition, as you guys are both mentioning, in, in a different way that uh, allows us to create more chances going forward. All right, now let's move on to... There's a youth tournament for our U19s over in Spain right now. And our first game was against England. And we came up with the goods and beat the three Lions 2-1 to one with goals from Correa Osadina and Rodrigo Neri. And the number 10, by the way, and wear the number 10 shirt for the U.S. is Owen Wolf, who is a friend of ours. Josh Wolf, a former teammate and roommate, roommate of mine with uh, the national team. His son wearing the number 10 shirt. And uh, that's, that's pretty cool. It makes me feel absolutely super old because i remember owen wolf when he was about three but uh I, I, I called the game when he had his first start uh for for austin uh this year and i mean he's a really i i think has more potential than his brother who's playing for atlanta united um and just has a little flashes of uh josh wolf in him that explosive sort of in tight spaces being mm -hmm able to spin in and up but uh again trying to find where his best position is whether it's on the wing whether it's up top whether it's in the midfield but a really really quality player so so charlie i know it's a youth national team tournament and there's nothing here but this is this is good for us maybe it's a sign of things to come when we play england in the world cup or you know i know there's you know you, you got to take everything with uh with a pinch of salt here but um what do you say i, I love that the u.s youngsters are are still developing and still you know, beating some of the world's best. I mean, at the end of the day, when we were all playing on the youth national teams, uh, maybe not you, Jimmy, no, but I, um, I sucked until I was like 27. <laughs> Jimmy tried to make Jimmy. Jimmy was would have made the U20s when he's about 26. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he, he was one of the three overage players. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy was like, "Can you not do that for the U17 national team?" Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think it just it shows it, it goes to show how, how much quality we have. You know, and I'd like to see us qualify for the next Olympics. That's for damn sure. Yeah, what's the problem there? That's unbelievable. That's honestly embarrassing that we haven't qualified for the last two Olympics. And and that's probably a podcast in itself where we just kind of break down what the hell happened with the people that were involved. Uh, Jason Christ and Caleb Porter in particular, who were the two coaches that were trying to lead us through that. That sounds like uh, that could be a bit of dumpster fire of a podcast, but very interesting. Listen, but I think ultimately, to your point, Charlie, I think this is a good sign that we're competitive at, at uh, all levels. And I think that's uh, an indication of where we're going as a nation and, and continues to give me more and more hope and optimism as to how competitive we can be going forward, especially in the 2026 World Cup, which we're hosting. And again, I just we haven't said this in a while, but what I really value about this upcoming World Cup is that we're going to give a lot of young players. We're going to have one of the youngest teams, if not the youngest team at the World Cup, a ton of experience. And that experience is going to prove to be invaluable for us when we approach the 2026 World Cup. So I, I now I have expectations of that one when we're hosting it because I think we can make a deep run, even though the format's yeah. going to change, and we'll get it's, into that moving forward. Go ahead, Heath. It's, it's pure optimism right now, right? I was I was actually going back uh, because I was working on the spreadsheet today about the about grants, actually about Christian Pulisic uh, and random numbers that he's been associated with. But somebody had put in there that he was the youngest player to be capped by the national team. And it was obviously wrong because he had Freddie Adu and others like that. But when I look through this stat sheet of the youngest capped players, there's like 30 of the top 50 are from like this generation or recent generation that have been capped before, you know, 17 years old, 18 years old, 19 years old, the number of players that we have. And then when you think about, you know, the Sullivan's of the world players that are between 12 and 14 years old, you might actually see a very different team come the world cup. Um, but but the talent pool that we have and the players that we have experienced, the positivity or optimism, if we didn't get to where we think that we can in this World Cup, you can immediately shift that to saying this is a this is a actually building something uh, for generations versus it being like, gosh, let's hope let's get to a World Cup and then we hope for the best and we hope for the draw and we get to the round of 16 and we hope to get out of it. Like I think we maybe did in the past with some young players mixed into these squads, but relying heavily on international experience to get us to this mm -hmm. point now we're, we're actually getting that through important games now and then we'll get a world cup and then and then 2026 will be hopefully something really special for the u.s <laughs>